I am Noah Smith from uh, Bloomberg Opinion. (laughs) And I'm Megan Day. I write for Jacobin uh, Magazine. Yeah. All right. So, and this is presumably neoliberalism versus democratic socialism um, is is kind of the way that it's framed. Um, But yeah, we just wanted to start off by talking about um, some recent democratic socialist news, which is that yesterday, uh, Julia Salazar, who is a self-described democratic socialist and a member of the Democratic Socialists of America, just won her state Senate campaign against nine-term incumbent uh, Martin DeLon in New York. And uh, Cynthia Nixon, who also calls herself a democratic socialist, lost to Andrew Cuomo. Um, and these are these are democratic socialists in the vein of Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. I think there are some notable distinctions between all three women, but in any case, what we're seeing is an explosion of this term into the political arena, partly as a short. It depends on who we're talking about, but to some people, as a shorthand for the left wing of the progressive edge of the Democratic Party and for some other people as, you know, to describe a sort of like long term vision for a different political economy besides the one that we have now. And then there's all sorts of gray area in there. What did, what have you been thinking about the about the recent, you know, rise of the term democratic socialism? Well, you know, at first it was very difficult to distinguish democratic socialism and social democracy. In fact, it's still different because those are terms that you know, if you if you talk to Europeans who think about the this stuff very very seriously and have been thinking about this very seriously for you know centuries, um, they will know exactly what the difference between social democracy and democratic socialism is. But if you talk to Americans who still think the word liberal just means anything on the left, it that distinction can sound a little bit like you know the uh, the People's Front of Judea versus the Judean People's Front from Monty Python. And um, and to be honest, I think that sometimes the substantive distinctions get blurred as well. So if you look at Bernie Sanders' campaign um, for the you know 2016 election, his primary campaign, a lot of the stuff he was talking about is stuff that Europeans would call social democracy. It was basically you know um, universal health care, free college, uh, stuff like that, very recognizable. And he he explicitly said we want to be like Denmark. And Denmark was this country he kept bringing up. We want to be like Denmark. Okay, fine. Um, At the same time, you started to see some people uh, calling, you know, bringing bringing old, uh, you know, Marxist rhetoric back into vogue about capital as this, not just as, you know, what economists think it is, which is a thing that you have. But instead, as this force, this agent, this this actor in society, you know, you are the tool of capital, et cetera, et cetera. And so I feel like that has created almost a bifurcation among people who call themselves democratic socialists, at least on Twitter and where I interact. There's people who think um, we want to be like Scandinavia. And there's people who think we need to completely rethink capitalism and, you know, overthrow capitalism and replace it with something else. And that something else is not necessarily clear yet what that is. But, um, but I think that there is this bifurcation and that, Bernie Sanders' social democracy-like campaign and Denmark-based rhetoric has, you know, contributed to that. Um, Anyway, what what do you think about that? I think that that's about right. I think that right now, so I'm a writer for Jacobin, which is an explicitly socialist magazine, and, you know, we have um, a socialist perspective that does, in fact, not see capitalism as the end of history, sort of desires a specific type of political economy after capitalism, which is socialist in nature, doesn't, as Marx said, you know, write, write recipes for the cookshops of the future, um, but you know, does try to think through some of the major questions about what, what a socialist society might look like and certainly what's wrong with a capitalist society today. Um, and we also publish a lot of stuff that appeals to people in the United States who are not necessarily all the way where we are to our left. Um, in part because that's where people's consciousness is at right now. Um, And so I think that there is some significant overlap. I'm also a member of the Democratic Socialists of America, and if I can give 
my assessment of what the makeup of that now 50,000 uh, person membership organization is, I think the most people are in the kind of Bernie Krat, um, social democratic camp. Um, and then there are some people who uh, consider themselves like revolutionary anti-capitalist and are fully against what they see as social democratic reformism. And then there's a third camp, which I would consider myself to be in, which is people who understand that the type of, we're so far back from our vision right now that our, our people who believe in a sort of like socialist future beyond capitalism, our program is going to line up pretty significantly with like a progressive or a social democratic program for the time being, in part because we need to materially empower working class people to take government and take society back from corporate interests and in order to even build the power necessary to do anything more ambitious than that and also because we need to do some serious class consciousness raising in the United States where it's almost impossible to talk about class and where people have just a very low level of understanding about class interests and class conflict and class struggle. Um, so yeah, I think you're right, but it's not just two. It's not just one or the other. I think there are lots of people, lots of very smart people, I think, who are trying to actually weave the two together and, and use a sort of social democratic program to um, build understanding and, and build material power and build a politics that can take us somewhere else. Does that right. make sense? Yeah, so so basically the um, where you're at is thinking we can save the question of whether to smash capitalism or be like Denmark for tomorrow. For now, let's build organization, let's build awareness, let's build consciousness um, and political power. Kind of. If anyone, that it depends on the context. If anyone asks me, I'll be very upfront about the fact that I think that, you know, the re it's not what makes us democratic socialists as opposed to social social democrats, like, but categorically, is, is that not only do we desire things like, you know, good health care, um, reasonable work hours and working conditions, uh, good housing, um, clean air, a justice system that actually delivers a semblance of justice, and so on and so forth. It's that we have an analysis of why we don't have those things, and the answer is capitalism. So I'm pretty upfront with people about the fact that I think that capitalism is, is sort of the root of a lot of the problems that we see. Um, and that in order to solve them, ultimately, we're going to have to replace capitalism with an, another thing. Um, but so it's not like I entirely think that we shouldn't talk about that question in the here and now. It's just that I'm willing to we're sort of willing to build build coalitions with people who are not totally there with us, uh, people who are just interested in things like Medicare for all people who are just interested in things like free college, maybe just for their own personal reasons, because they've, you know, suffered under, you know, staggering medical debt or college debt, or they've experienced, you know, denial of coverage or um, denial of care, health care, or because they've had their opportunities stunted because they haven't been able to get the training and the education necessary to get the kind of job that would allow them to pay in the city that they want to live in with people that they love and their families and so on and so forth. So maybe those people are not ready to talk talk about ending capitalism right now and we're still gonna you know push for these demands on the ground alongside them even if they sort of look social democratic right i don't i don't think that's necessarily a bad thing does that make sense yeah no it absolutely makes sense um i think that one one peril of this approach mm -hmm. is that um it, it ends up looking a little bit like what internet people call the uh, the Mott and Bailey strategy. Are you familiar with that term? Not at all familiar. Okay, so the, the idea of Mott and Bailey um, is that you have a um, uh, you have a you have two arguments, basically. One which is really easy uh, for everybody to accept and then one which is very uh, you know, sort of extremist and you conflate the arguments so that you um you, you look like you're making an extremist argument all the time, and then when you get challenged on it, like, oh, you're, that's an extremist argument. How can you think that? Then you retreat to the, um, the, the uh, very defensible argument. So in this case, I think to some people, it looks like the DSA is basically engaged in a large modern Bailey operation where they say, um, end capitalism, smash capitalism, and then you know, opponents of this idea say, well, hold on a second, that failed in, you know, Mao's China and the Soviet Union, blah, 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 blah. And then the, the you know, 
look at Venezuela, etc., say the uh, defenders of capitalism, and then the um, and then the DSA sort of retreats to, oh, but look at Denmark, look mm-hmm. at Sweden, look mm-hmm. at Norway, and then. So it's this idea of using the um, the sort of social democracy as the uh, as the defensible, reasonable position that everyone can kind of agree on, and then with the smash capitalism as the you know sort of the um, the argument that that gets made until someone challenges it, right? And it's, it's this two step you know kind of kind of thing, and I think some people do. At least I've seen you know people complain and, and gripe about this idea the idea that smash capitalism smash capitalism wait really smash capitalism what you don't like denmark mm-hmm. and then so I, I there's some sense that there this is going on and that the the delaying of the uh of the definitions the the um the sort of the sort of like let's figure out what we want to do after we start winning more attitude is is you know creating this this kind of um conflation right i i hear that that's interesting the martin bailey thing i'd never heard before i think that's um it's an interesting formulation i i i i'm not sure that i see a ton of people who yell smash capitalism also immediately turning around and saying but look at denmark like i was saying before i actually think that there are kind of two different camps i see them often right. like and they're actually in competition with each other in DSA, which is really interesting. Yes. There's all yes. sorts of internal conflicts, and the socialist left is like revitalized now, which means that it has all sorts of new dynamics that were basically dormant right. for 50 years, and many of them are repeats of old dynamics, except that people have not necessarily read all the socialist history, and so it, sometimes it feels like we're doing, you know, reinventing the wheel a little bit. Right. Um, but I, I will, I don't know, I just want to address... Um, one of these things, which is like whether or not we should, whether or not the burden of proof is on socialists to describe what a socialist future should look like. I mean, the way that you phrased it was deferring definitions until we start winning more. And I'm not really sure that that formulation is fair, considering that we live under capitalism. We have lots of problems that people, intelligent people who are socialists, intelligent people who are cr- cr- critics of, of capitalism, um, understand to be derived from the functional way that capitalism is set up. It isn't, I just feel like sometimes, I don't fight on Twitter anymore. I used to be on Twitter. I deleted my Twitter account. feels awesome. But I catch, I catch glimmers here and there. And I feel like the burden of proof is often shifted on socialists to, to explain, first of all, to atone for the sins of societies that looked extremely, extremely different from the United States in 2018 and carried out very different forms of experiments than the ones that people are even advocating. And two... Why not? Why isn't the burden of proof on capitalists to explain why capitalist ideologues, that is, not people who own cap, you know, capital assets, but people who are, are defenders of capitalism, to explain why this is the best that humanity has to offer? Right. This seems to be one of the problems with the discourse from the other side, from from my side looking in. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So I think um, in terms of so so absolutely the two competing camps absolutely are different and the the people who might be seen as playing the modern bailey strategy are sort of i think people like you who 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 try to just say well let's just have peace between these camps while we while we build some political strength and so you know um the idea that you might say oh here are our uh democratic socialists you know here here are our moderates whenever whenever challenged we have some moderates over here and then, you know, as soon as the radicals get challenged, the people who sort of, you know, want to present DSA as a united front say, oh, but we have all these moderates over here. Here, talk to our moderates. And so, anyway, that was what I was saying. But but as for the, the burden of proof, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's an important point. And I think that um, basically whether you have the burden of proof on the people who want change or the people who want the status quo has to do with how much people really dislike the status quo. Mm -hmm. And that when you have people, if, if you have people who are, you know, starving and you have mass economic calamity, you're not going to have a lot of people supporting the status quo. And that if you have, you know, um, people who are all essentially middle class and doing okay and maybe not, able to afford quite the size of the house that they'd want or have quite as nice of a job as they want, but who 
you know, are ultimately doing kind of okay, then you're going to have more, a lot more status quo bias. And I think right now we find ourselves in this weird middle ground where you have a lot of people in America who really are kind of doing okay and then a lot of people who are not doing okay. We have this very big country with geographic diversity, with a lot of inequality. You have um, uh, people in, in poor neighborhoods who are essentially living as if they're in a third world country who have essentially no status quo bias and who aren't going to be scared with stories of Venezuela. And you have people who, you have vast numbers of people who are essentially middle class, who are living both in cities and suburbs, who have, you know, decent apartments that cost a bit too much, who have decent jobs that offer a little too less meaning and not quite enough advancement options and things like that, but who, who don't want to tear up the system. And so we've got this country that's so big and so diverse and so um, heterogeneous in all these ways that we're in this interesting middle ground where you have some people who, th- who say that the burden of, who, who will be very receptive to the idea that the burden of proof should be on people who want to tear up the current system. Mm-hmm. And some people who be very receptive to the opposite. And I think that really, um, that is going to make it hard. That, that's that's going to make it very hard. I mean, from my, my, my instinct is to say the burden of proof is on people uh, to tear up the system. Mm-hmm. Because this is, you know, despite our problems, our, our median income, our median standard of living remains one of the better ones in the world. And... Um, it's not as good of a record as we'd want, but it is a far, like, it's not the kind of system that's in desperate collapse. Um, that's my instinct. My, I, I do have status quo bias against tearing up our system. I look around and I see a country of people where enough people are doing basically okay that I'm scared of replacing our system with, quote unquote, something else <laughs> to TBD. Right. Um, but I, but I, I absolutely respect and understand people who feel the opposite, who feel that this, that our system is horrible enough that we need that it, it, that it will not be patched, and that we should start from the premise that it needs to be torn up. I, yeah, thanks for saying all that. I think that's actually that's that's totally you make some extremely fair points, and I'm really interested in this question of status quo bias. I'm not sure how much. I think that political, recent political events have demonstrated to us that there's less status quo bias than perhaps we think. I mean, we do have Donald Trump as president, largely because people wanted something different and he represented the most different thing that has ever come along, right? And we also saw the rise of Bernie Sanders for com- he, with a completely different message and a totally different set of politics, also completely came out of left field without the Democratic Party um, establishment behind him, without any sort of support from like key political players who know how the game is is operated um, and managed to uh, get, what was it? Was it 13 million votes in the primary? I think that was the number. I don't remember the number. He got about 41%, I want to say, of the primary vote. That's a, that's a very strong showing. It is a strong showing. I don't think think the strongest showing, the strongest showing for kind of a, um, you know, the uh, candidate from the left since what McGovern. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, in any case, I think that with both of those things, we can see that um, status quo bias is definitely wearing thin, which isn't to say that it doesn't have like a strong rootedness, but it's definitely wearing thin. And the reasons for that are, I think, pretty evident. I mean, the financial collapse in 2008 um, turned a lot of people's worlds upside down. And I, speaking as a 29-year-old, you know, I graduated from college in 2012, and I'm not a person who is in dire financial straits, but certainly sometimes it doesn't take crushing misery to make you question the status quo. Sometimes it takes disappointment, and I actually think that there are whole generation of people who are just like, and I don't, and I think that there's a tendency on the right or in the center to say that these people are spoiled, right? Because like, you know, life is disappointing or whatever, but it, it, this is a genuinely real phenomenon. People think that they, if they work hard enough, if they, you know, take on the student loans and they put in the hours and they be the best that they can be, that some, that they'll be rewarded. And, you know, like in my, in my experience, you know, it was like unpaid internship after unpaid internship, finally culminating in an internship that was 
was paid less than minimum wage, which I thought that was like my, and that happened right during the 2016 primary when I was in this sort of less than minimum wage paid internship as a 20 six or seven year olds and you can see how it's not it's not that there's like this is not like misery or calamity this my my own personal breaking point was more of just like a disappointment and disgust if that makes sense um and then also it absolutely the, makes sense yeah and then and and furthermore when i when we say tear up the system we if this is a matter of rhetoric i personally think that i don't go around saying smash capitalism i don't go around saying tear up the system i personally feel like we should end capitalism capitalism the way that i define it not is, smash it just end it yeah no 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 well hear me out um because capitalism is as marx marx said liber it was liberatory for many different societies from you know chains of feudal bondage various forms of hierarchy and domination that were truly horrendous and like deep uh, long dark ages during which the technological innovation required to make people's lives not miserable simply wasn't happening right so i think we can acknowledge that capitalism was a revolutionary and positive force for many people but while people became you know free to no longer serve a lord or master they they didn't achieve sort of full human freedom like you became you became free now if you were a working person which is the majority of people people who don't own factories or productive assets to sell your labor to a capitalist provided that they want to buy it that's your freedom you're but you're not free to not work for a capitalist at all typically and that's the situation that we're in right now where the vast majority of people are spending most of their lives selling their labor on the open market to capitalists and orienting all of their lives around how to do that most effectively to get as much money as possible to then give to other capitalists in the form of landlords in the form of you know uh, you know health and health insurance companies or healthcare companies and so on and so forth um, and so for me, it's not like, it's more like, how can we evolve? How can we build on some of the technological innovations of capitalism and build beyond that, um, to a system that's not oriented around private profits, a system where people don't have to sell their labor on the open market to capitalists who own productive assets, um, and where people are actually, you know, sort of free to live their lives to the fullest, you know, right? It's like a vision of human flourishing that actually builds on some of what capitalism has brought us. Does that make sense? It, it makes, it makes sense. I'm just wondering, you know, do we need the vision of human flourishing in place? So, so Marx, I think one of the big appeals of Marx was that he had an alternative and it was a very detailed alternative about what, an, what the system will look like beyond capitalism. Um, you had, uh, I mean, I mean, he, he gave a lot of details about how, how, what became communism would work. And, um, I think that those those details, of course, got interpreted in maybe silly ways by by people like Lenin, um, you know, who of course would come out with a different definition each week of what Marxism meant, and let's implement that this week. And um, but I feel like when you don't have that vision, when you when you say uh, let's have a system where we don't have to work for capitalists, where we where we don't have to work for private profit, et cetera, well, what will you be working for is the question. What will that system be? Um, when, it, when I hear about replacing capitalism with something else, uh, as, you're, as you said, I I, something I else. Socialism, pretty clearly. If I haven't, then I'll say it now. We're replacing capitalism with socialism. We just have to work out the details of what that socialism will look like, which is a collective project and one in progress. Okay. I mean, so will, you know, will there be a government bureaucracy um, deciding what phones will be made and what phones people will have? Will there be uh, workers' cooperatives mm -hmm. deciding what phones pe will be made and what phones people will have? Um, will people get phone credits that they can then exchange for phones? And will everyone have the same phone? And you can, once you start ask, getting into the weeds of this, and once you start asking about the details, you, I mean, there, you, you know, there are, Questions are discrediting as opposed to questions that we simply have to answer if we want to evolve beyond. Basically, look, think about it this way. Capitalism is the idea that capitalism is the best that we can do is predicated on an assumption that the laws of supply and demand work perfectly enough that sort of equal 
equilibrium can be achieved, optimum prices can be found, and when there is enough of a demand, the capitalist market will actually produce the supply to meet that demand. That's patently false under capitalism. For example, there's a great demand for calories all over the world. People are very, very hungry. They are starving. There is actually the supply to, <laughs> to give people those calories, but it doesn't reach them because food under capitalism is a commodity meant for profit. It's not meant to solve human hunger, right? right. So this is the, so, so when you ask these questions about who's going to get, you know, what phone and who's going to make it, these are not disqualifying questions. These are the questions that we have to answer all together when we decide that we're going to actually build a that's, socialist that's, that's society. That's what I mean. That's right, what I mean. right, right. Yeah, they, they have, those are questions that have to be answered. No, That's what I'm, I mean. I'm agreeing with you. I'm excited, to, but here's the thing. I'm excited to answer those questions. And I actually have thoughts on these questions, and so do many socialists that I know. And I've noticed a tendency That's great. from people on the center to act as though we've never thought about this before. Who would make the phones? Yes, indeed. Who would make the phones? Like, join us in thinking about that question, right? And when we think about the history of various communist experiments, various experiments in central planning, instead of those being disqualifying histories, those should be lessons to learn from. And if you don't agree with me, then why would you then think that the failures of capitalism do not disqualify capitalism, right? Like there are people starving, there are people literally dying in landslides of garbage under our capitalist system. And if that doesn't disqualify capitalism, then I'm not sure why the failures of the Soviet Union would disqualify socialism. So there are lots of, I think it's a completely open question whether or not orienting the productive capacities of society around profit versus around, you know, what humans need, like which one of those is better. I tend toward the latter. And I think we can do it. And I think that we have to come together to like answer those questions. And I, I've noticed that centrists and, and right-wingers in particular will raise those questions condescendingly as though the mere existence of those questions and the fact that we don't have the actual blueprint written out itself disqualifies us as like intelligent interlocutors and that's you know it's pretty annoying i'm not saying that you're doing that but i've noticed it um yeah i mean the idea that these questions shouldn't even be asked is bad but um but then i mean I, what, what I'm saying, like, when people have status quo bias, the reason is because, t you know, when they, if, if you're going to tear up the system, and then you ask, well, you're going to tear up the system and replace it with what? And the answer is, I'm excited to think about what we're going to replace it with. Then I think that the answer of anyone who has, you know, a reasonable amount of status quo bias will be to say, and? Mm -hmm go on and and want to see those answers so um, I have, I, can I well, hold on yeah, yeah, sure, go ahead. so so let's let's talk about food mm -hmm. um the uh it the word neoliberalism is a, is a silly word uh and lots of people um unlike socialism it's not a word that everyone is clamoring to own it's a word that a lot of people are clamoring to make someone else own and then there's a few goofy online people who um, who decided to just own it because fun. And then they decided to elect me their chief shill in a rigged election. And that is how I became the chief neoliberal shill. Um, it was all a joke. But so let's say that we want to define neoliberalism as kind of broadly the approach we've had under uh, Clinton and Obama, and to a lesser degree, uh, George W. Bush. Um, suppose we want to define neoliberalism as we're not going to mess with the basic structures of capitalism, we're just going to try to patch it. We're going to try to do things like food stamps. We see people don't have enough food, so we'll give them some food stamps to buy food. We see people don't have enough housing, so we'll give them Section 8 housing vouchers to buy housing. We see that people don't have enough health care, um, you know, we'll do Obamacare kind of thing. Uh, and so let, let's, let's just for the purpose of this conversation, let's define neoliberalism as this, you know, the silly word, let's define it as that approach, patching up the, the system instead of overhauling the system. That's a, a pretty clear idea, right? So um, you look at child poverty in America, and you see that child poverty is at an all-time low using the supplemental uh, poverty measure. Um, Food insecurity 
is also at an all-time low. Are they way too high for an ideal society? Yeah. Yeah, they are. But there has been progress made. Um, homelessness is down substantially, about a fifth, um, because of the housing first policies. Uh, you might not know it if you lived in San Francisco, where there's lots of homeless people, but then actually nationwide, there's been reasonably big progress against homelessness. So if you're, if, you know, if I'm going to be a defender of the current system, I'm not going to say the market reaches equilibrium and you will take what the market gives you and that. I'm going to say, yeah, the market's not perfect, but we've been increasingly patching it up and, um, you know, we're not nearly as good as we could be, but the patching is working and things are better than they used to be, notwithstanding the ennui of highly educated people who work through unpaid internships, um, you know, notwithstanding the ennui of the, of the educated upper middle class, um, the the actual poor, the people who are destitute and who are being buried under landslides of garbage and who are worrying about where their next meal is going to come from, we're doing a bit better by those people, better and better. And that's the that's the defense of the status quo that I see, that, that the trend has been good, and why mess with that trend? Do you know how much we reduced poverty in 2017 in the United States? In the last year? 0.4%. And that's one year, though. Yeah, no, that's, that's a big saying. gain for that's, one year. That's what I'm saying. It's actually not enough. Like, if we're literally, how many years would it take to eradicate? Given that this is your your idea of how we're supposed to go about lifting people out of poverty is just incremental gains year upon year, and of course, notwithstanding any financial calamities, which we know have happened and are going to happen again and set set people back. It's not enough. It's not good enough to actually fix the problem of poverty. And I understand your point about ennui. My point was just to give you a sense of why people across the economic spectrum are experiencing the collapse of status quo bias and to speak from my own experience that there are actually lots and lots of people, vastly more people who don't have the opportunities that I had who are experiencing status quo collapse for completely different reasons than I experienced them. Those people are, for instance, drowning in medical debt and unable to get the medical care that they need. They're drowning in student debt and they cannot see a light at the end of the tunnel because the jobs that they're working not only don't pay them enough, especially given rising living costs, but also don't give them reasonable benefits, which means that they have to supplement that out of their own paycheck. So they're getting paid less and less in real wages. So when you're talking about the system that we have right now is making gains, those gains are so incremental that I honestly think, I mean, I think it's kind of it speaks for itself that 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 some people want to like defend that as how we're going to lift ourselves out of the current status quo. It's not good enough. Right. We, could, we need something more ambitious than like 0.4 percent year after year eradicating poverty when we have millions of people in poverty in the United States and and a record high number of billionaires for what it's. Worth. I mean, 0.4 percent is such for one year is such a good result that. You know, I have to think that that's almost a, a spurious result and just an effect of the macroeconomic recovery. It's less than Point the previous two years. It's actually less than the pre the previous two years. So it's actually a flagging. That's 0.4%, a 0.4%, point four percent. A point four percentage points reduction in poverty is good. Okay, any reduction in poverty is good, but you realize we're not actually up to the levels of pre-financial collapse. So we're just going to one year. the tiniest, tiny, right. So, I Our mean, poverty is way below the level from before no, no, the financial no. collapse. The math. If you're going to solve poverty 0.4% per year, I'm just off the top of my head, it's over 200 years until we lift everybody out of poverty. I don't think that that's good enough. We need more ambitious changes. For example, Medicare Wait, for... do you mean... And, hold on, Megan. Megan, do you mean 0.4 percentage points? Yeah, I'm sorry. Point four percent. So, for example, if the poverty rate is if the poverty rate is ten percent, say, and you lower the poverty rate by one percentage point, you've cut poverty. You cut the number of people in poverty by ten percent, approximately. So, percentage points versus percent is a big math math. So, when you say do the math, that's what you need to do the math. You, uh, you poverty, need to know the, the difference between a percent right. and a percentage point is incredibly key when you're talking about a relatively low percentage of the population. Okay, poverty, uh, poverty was was not reduced by 10% in 2017. I'm going to leave this one open because I think this is your area of expertise. I can mine. look it up, but it's going to slow my Skype up. down.
I'll, I'll point you towards the um, in, environmental policy um, okay. initiative numbers that they but, published yesterday after the census, the census right. bureau report came out. So my question is, have you looked at the supplemental poverty measure? So the supplemental poverty measure is, you know, this new measure uh, that's, you know, very comprehensive and takes into account a lot of sources of income and blah, blah, blah. Um, and the uh, Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, you know, recently had a report showing that using the supplemental poverty measure, it shows the large progress that's actually been made against poverty in the past 20 years. Right. Okay. Actually, I do know about this. I was looking into this yesterday. Um the what do you think about that? Well, well I, you know, look, this is not my area of expertise. I'm actually more and less of an econ person and more of a politics person. Not everybody can be everything, but I try to do my best to, you know, like I never actually studied an econ in college. I try to do my best to teach myself and to learn. And one thing that I was looking at yesterday from EPI's report is that they were saying that this supplemental poverty measure demonstrates the successes of various, you know, social democratic interventions, which I think is fantastic. And I completely think that as a leftist, there's, you will not find me saying that we shouldn't pursue various, you know, social, social democratic, sa social safety net patching and beefing up kinds of measures. But right. I just, I, my greater point before we got into the weeds with the actual numbers, which I think we're going to have to like go back and look yes, into, is that, is that we, um, is that if we, if we like that those, those things are happening on a small scale, why not do them on a larger scale? Isn't it for the further proof that, for instance, if we think that like, one of the best things that Obamacare did was Medicaid expansion. Why the hell not go for Medicare for all, right? And actually, I'd like to hear you explain that. Do you have an opposition to Medicare for all? I'm very curious. That's a good question, actually. Um, I think that extending... So, so do you, you know the Medicare X plan? Yeah. Are you familiar with it? Maybe not. I'm okay, not it's... Um, I forget exactly who, did. Oh, I want to say Cory Booker, but it might not be. This is one of these new, like, it's Medicare, it's not Medicare for all, it's like, it's something in between Obamacare and Medicare for all, it's a sort of, like, watered down. Uh, that's something, no, that's something else. So, mm -hmm. so Medicare X extends the current Medicare system to everybody. Mm -hmm. It takes the currently existing Medicare system and says, you can buy that, you, you can just opt right. into that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so when, you, when people hear the term Medicare for all, uh, the, the, the term Medicare for all now applies to a plan that's actually much closer to the Canadian system, whereas actually existing Medicare for all has gone by the term of Medicare X in the legislature. Right. And so if I had to pick between the current system and the quote unquote Medicare for all system being promoted by DSA, I would pick Medicare for all as promoted by DSA because we need universal health care we need the government to provide everybody with health care it just works better our our system has failed in health care we have the the same quality health care as every other rich country and we have twice the cost of that health care and much more uncertainty for people and much more hassle cost and much more you know sort of inequality in the system than other rich countries it is a failure we just need we need government health care so if you ask me to choose between, you know, the, the thing that now calls itself Medicare for all and the current system, absolutely Medicare for all. But if you ask me to choose between Medicare for all and a slightly different plan um, that uh, is, you know, more like more like the Japanese system or maybe maybe the French system, I would probably choose that. I would say that that um, Medicare for all. Good. Uh, do it. Um, is it the very best I can think of? No. At this point, does that matter? No. So, yes, Medicare for all is good. The current system is the worst. Okay. Um, so now to bring it to the level of sort of like big picture politics, what's wrong with the current system and why would Medicare for all be preferable? And this is where we get to the question of do we want to do incremental changes or do we want to do large scale changes and what is, right. and where does capitalism factor into this? And I'll answer personally my own question first before I get oh, yeah, no, go, go, go. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, it's important for us, you know, people in DSA and people at Jacobin and people generally that I know who are interested in thinking through these questions are very, you know, interested in pushing Medicare for all in part because 70% of Americans now say that they support Medicare for all. And this is the largest scale demand to decommodify something 
that we've seen in 50 plus years in the United States. So that's, you know, something that socialists who want to end capitalism and replace it with socialism, obviously, we're very interested in talking about that. But it's not just sheer opportunism. It's because within this, we see that the logic of capitalism actually crumbles a little bit and people realize that the the market and the capitalist markets which are oriented around private profits for individuals who own productive assets are not the best way to organize society or the best way to give people things that they need because the market under capitalism is not sending signals about what people need it's sending signals about how profit can be maximized and people are listening to those signals and that's how they're organizing society right yep. so that's why yep. we talk about that that's why so so this goes back to the very first question which is like what's up with all these like people who want to talk about ending capitalism just like kind of saying kind of milk toast social democratic things like you see how there are connections there right oh, yeah. sense? and and so i think that this is going to be a big winner mm-hmm. for dsa for the whole idea of socialism, universal health care is going to be a big winner because, um, so I, I think that, let me step back and, and give you my perspective instead of saying this is what this defender of the status quo would say. Let me give you my perspective, which is that when you look at the 20th century, you, uh, um, you know, which was the century of the industrial, of industrialization, you basically see a uh, big confusion about which industries would be best provided by private uh, industry and which which things would best be provided by government. And defenders of capitalism will say, ah, oh, well, we realize that government is bad for everything. And that's actually not what happened. What happened was that we settled on this sort of equilibrium where government provides maybe about half the things. Mm-hmm. And um, essentially nowhere has privatized education. Essentially, nowhere has privatized roads. Essentially, nowhere has privatized for-profit universities. They're either non-profits or much more often government-provided. Um, essentially, nowhere has um, uh, completely privatized utilities. Utilities have been this big. So, so for about half the stuff in our economy... Uh, half the industries, we decided actually government is better at this. And we all sort of accepted that. And except for the Milton Friedmans of the world and the people who want to privatize stuff. But we all just accepted government schools are actually the way to go, at least for, you know, primary school. Um, and and maybe government and nonprofit for college. And then um, and government roads are the best. Maybe occasionally you have like a turnpike or something. I hate turnpikes. But then, you know, but, but pretty much government roads are the best. Government builds and fixes the roads. And so we had, but then, but then basically everybody who said government is going to provide the food lost big and got crushed. That mm-hmm. never, ever worked. Um, everybody does use ag subsidies and, and, you know, sort of price supports for farmers and things like that. But then everybody who said, okay, government's going to provide your food now. That was an epic flaming disaster with tens of millions of people dead. And things that said, uh, people who said government is going to provide your consumer products, you know, your sports drinks and your phones and all that crap that we mentioned before, you know, it didn't turn into a giant flaming disaster, but it wasn't very great either. And, uh, and so we ended up having that sort of be privatized. And healthcare was this interesting thing because it fell in the middle of it. Some countries said, okay, government is going to provide you healthcare, Britain, NHS, we do it. And mm-hmm. some countries said, you know, America said, no, you know, private sector is going to provide health care and then we're going to make a bunch of, you know, like regulations to try to make it work right, which never worked. Um, and then um, and then some countries in the middle said, like, you know, Switzerland or whatever said, OK, well, um, we're going to have the government pay these companies to give you health care. And then Japan said, we're going to have the government pay for 70 percent of your health care. And, you know, all these, uh, you know, countries did these different systems. And I think we're because healthcare was kind of right in the middle of what, you know, government working versus versus private stuff working, but we're we're finally realizing, I think, that government just is a bit better at it. Government is better. You know, right. America American healthcare system is is crap, but it's um I mean people people do get some healthcare in the system, but it's it's crap compared to the government systems. And I think we're what's happening now is sort of this belated realization in America that, oh yeah, government actually does this better. And, uh, but in a way, 
my own view is that this is the la- this is the final shaking out of this 20th century sorting process mm. that um, the fact we realized government is better for healthcare. Does this mean we want to go back and try government for food again? I would move if right. someone tried that. So um, there's a lot of stuff in there that I want to address. And I'm not really sure what to address for us. All, it's all really interesting. Um, that's, that sort of account of history is not necessarily the way that I would tell the story, but I appreciate you telling it that way because it helps me orient. You know, it's like it's a, it, tell, it tells me a lot about your ideology that you told the story in that particular way. Um, for example, when you talk about the sort of experiments that various governments, you know, undertook in providing people food, it seems kind of devoid of context. Like, there are the governments that did, in fact, try to do that were governments that, for a variety of reasons, the strong capitalist interests in advanced, um, in advanced capitalist democracies were not available to be, like, you know, usurped for the purposes of the socialist experiment, right? So the com- the countries that were, were like the USSR and China and various places like that. Now, those places were very underdeveloped. They may have mostly peasant ag- um, and agricultural worker um, economies and basically tried to dra- drag them kicking and screaming into like some sort of like perfectly fully formed centrally planned socialist uh, society. Obviously, that didn't work super well. You won't find me like, you know, like trying to butter up those those histories. I really won't. But um, but at the same time, I think it's important to note that, you know, there are like studies that in Jacobin, we had an article basically demonstrating that over a slightly longer period than the, the Chinese famines, which were much more acute and horrible, there were also famines in India, which was experiencing, you know, being dragged in a capitalist way into, like, into development, right? And those numbers actually dwarf the numbers of the famines in China. In China. So I'm not really, I, I, yeah, yeah, well, I mean, I'll just point you, no. and, we'll, and we'll include the links to the, to the article, and then, you know, okay. you have to let people... No, I, I've looked into that, yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say is that, I mean, for me, the idea that we can have some sort of equilibrium where we decide, okay, the government's going to d- provide some of these, like some stuff, and we'll decide which ones it is. And then if the government's not good at providing the other things, then we'll decide which ones those are. This ignores political power, because if you have private profit-making capitalists that make lots and lots of money by appropriating the surplus labor value of workers who work for their firms. They grow outsized political power, which means that they have the power to, you know, infiltrate government, to um, throw their weight around in society and claw back those changes. And they're going to do exactly what we see in the United States right now, which is trying to privatize the stuff that we've decided should be public. Like, schools. We see the school privatization movement is massive. And of course, healthcare, even if we had decided, which we hadn't, and even if we do decide that we want to do government provided health insurance, which is all that Medicare for all is, you you can bet that there are going to be capitalist interests that are going to try and to figure out a way to privatize that once more. And they'll probably succeed because when you have capitalists in society, those people have power and they are able to exert that power to push a privatization agenda. It's like, it's not, we're not going to like reach a consensus and everyone's going to be cool with that. And the reason is because capitalists are driven by the profit motive, specifically a compulsion to maximize profit because they have to, because all economic actors under capitalism are in competition with each other, including capitalists in competition with other capitalists. So they have to open up new lucrative revenue streams. They have to find new sources of profit making in order to beat out the competition so they their firms don't collapse. So it's not that there's bad people. It's that when you have capitalist actors in society at all, when you have capitalism, all your gains you make where you're like, I'm carving out this space as a government only space. This is going to be public, et cetera, et cetera. Those are constantly in peril because the sharks are always circling around them, just like as a basic function of how capitalism is set up and the compulsion to maximize profit under capitalism. Do you agree with that? I do. Mm -hmm. And um, so I want to talk about that, and I want to talk about history of farming. So (laughs) so I'll I'll, I'll say one thing about history of farming, and then we can talk about political power and and manipulation of the political system. The cool thing about history of farming um, that I've just recently gotten into after I read a book called How Asia Works by Joe Studwell. Um, and I, then I read a whole bunch of other stuff about this. Um, 
there actually was a system of farming that worked really well for poor countries, poor underdeveloped countries, which was basically you had a whole bunch of small farmers essentially doing very high intensity farming on very small plots who were ruled by landlords, essentially, who took all their surplus and made them starve and, and you know, screw them over. And so the, the system that ended up working, especially in Taiwan, Japan, and uh, to some extent, South Korea, was, um, and, and also actually bore some dividends in India as well, was to take, basically expropriate the landlords. Um, you could compensate them with bonds that quickly depreciated or not. Uh, but they basically take the land away, give it to the small farmers who are already farming and let them own their own land. Um, in Taiwan, which was probably the best at this, it was called the land to the tiller program. Um, give the, basically expropriate the landlords, give the small farmers their farms, and then give them government support in the form of agriculture extension services and marketing, but then let them essentially sell their products and be independent gardening business people. That actually worked really well for economies that were astonishingly poor and astonishingly illiterate and astonishingly underdeveloped um, at the time that, that that was done. When did it stop working and why? It, it never stopped working. It, it's, it, still, it's still the case that these are basically yeoman farming societies where like, like agricultural workers are extremely prosperous and they own their land and I, I wouldn't know anything about this. So, so in short, to, to oversimplify, what happened is that you had a period where a lot of people um, you know, got old and then they tried to pass it on to their kids. Their kids didn't want to do it anymore. They sold the business and moved to town and became middle class people. Why and then some people... Anymore, though, if it was so great. Why didn't their kids want to do it anymore? Uh, okay. Cities are nice to live in. They wanted to are live in cities. Are cities nice to live in? I mean, I, they're not necessarily. People typically have economic reasons for mass migration. So I'm not really sure if they were just drawn by like the nightlife or. I, I mean, know. it just seems like That's you're. I'm, I'm just asking. But, the, the but then some people. Well, for like a couple decades or, or whatever, I need to understand why why it ended, right? Well, some other people also went back. So, so you do see a movement of uh, young people, including a lot of highly educated young people, to go farm. Um, I know a number of biology, uh, you know, grad students who, after finishing their degrees, went to go become organic farmers in upstate New York or, uh, you know, Kyushu, Japan, or somewhere like that. And um, and so that that is happening as well. Right, but that's uh, like less than like point. I mean, that's like point less than point five percent. That's right. Because, because like it's not a heck of a lot of people. Yeah, it's really pretty, pretty yeah. small. So, but but the answer the answer is that um, once countries got rich. Uh, most of the small farmers sold off their farms, not to large landlords um, like before in the poor countries, but to agribusiness. Right. They took the money, they moved to the city, they got corporate jobs, or they opened small businesses, or they did whatever on their own. And those those societies became pretty wealthy, much more middle class societies in the end. Uh, if you look at um, Japan, you know, it has problems, but, you know doing okay well it's a good question uh, because one of the things that happens in that process and again you're telling me history that i don't know i'm not i'm not, I'm not well versed in this stuff but i can tell from what you're saying that individual you know small landowners they sold probably on mass like there was a mass migration to the cities and they sold their land and the joining properties to large agribusiness like you say in that, that process specific actors while they may go and they, they get to be like slightly prosperous living in a city you know that feels that's good um there are people who are becoming massively wealthy because they are buying up all of this land and they're basically doing like a mass ag agribusiness and they're building a lot of a lot of wealth and a lot of power in society right. yeah so, so let's talk about that let's talk about that and so that the problem with that is that you can reach a stasis for a minute but when those people have that much power in society eventually what they're going to do is do things like depress wages as much as they possibly can get away with because that is how they maximize overhead, which again means maximizing profit, which again is their compulsion as capitalists. And they throw their weight around in the political sphere, which erodes the quality of democracy. And they probably privatize all the things that a society has decided that it wants to actually provide through the state, right, over time. Right. And so, so now let's get to the, the big question, which is political power. Mm -hmm. The idea is if some people have a lot of money, they're also going to use that money to influence politics in their favor. Mm. How do you balance that out? Mm. Um, and the idea is that instead of continually having to have social movements 
to, you know, organize a whole bunch of people to cancel out the power of the rich people, maybe we should just make a sit, you know, a, a country where nobody gets rich. Mm. Um, yeah, maybe. That seems like an extreme solution. Isn't because... I don't know. It's, it's, it's kind of extreme right now that we have a country where people can get so rich and throw their weight around, you know? It's the only extreme I mean, that doesn't exist yet, right? I mean, the current system is actually rather extreme. There have been studies showing that we live in an oligarchy, not a democracy. What does that mean? I, I don't know. I, I thought it was interesting, though. There was some sort of, like, UK-based study on, on, based out of, like, LSE or something. I'll try to dig it up and throw What does it mean? Up. Like, what... what how would it you measure oligarchy versus citizen, democracy? The average citizen has like a, a net net zero voice in their democracy because of the weight of money in politics and the. How would you the, measure that? I don't know how they measured it. I think it's. I thought okay. the, the conclusion was interesting, and you know what? Well, I haven't seen the numbers, but the conclusion. You don't know how you me- they measured it, but you believe it? No. What I was about to say is that the is that the conclusion rings true to me from a political perspective as an observer of my own democracy. I can. You don't tell feel you have a yes. voice. I'm sorry. You don't feel you have a voice. No, I don't feel like the average person has a voice in, in, in our democracy. You know, what's interesting. Um, it, you know, political economists have been wondering about this paradox for a while. The paradox of voting. Why do people vote when one vote, you know, almost zero elections are, have ever been decided by one vote. And the, the probability that an election will be decided by your vote is astronomically small. Why does anyone vote when they, they personally can't change the the um, the outcome. Of course, the answer is that people vote for a feeling of self-expression because they feel like they have a voice, even if their vote rationally, perfectly rationally, will never change the outcome of an election. People, It gives people the feeling that they have a voice. So the feeling of inclusion and the feeling of having a voice is really important, even if it's often an illusion. I think it's really important to make people feel included, to make people feel like this is their country, their democracy, their regime, and it's not just being controlled by oligarchs. You know, I think that most people who feel that there's some rich person out there controlling the political system have no concrete idea of how that's happening or who that rich person is or how the control works. But they just feel like they they have no voice. And, um, and so I think, yeah, I think that it's really important to give people the feeling of having a voice. Um, if we smashed capitalism and made it so that nobody can get rich, uh, would people then feel like they have a voice or not? Um, we can, America has, has a lot of rich people more than, you know, more rich people per capita than any country around, I think maybe. And, um, and there are a lot of countries that are more equal than us. And I would like to go to those countries and say to those people, do you, you know, how much of a voice do you feel that you have? Um, I think that looking at Europe might not be a great example because a lot because of the way the EU works. I think a lot of people feel like they don't have a voice there. Um, in Japan, you have m- really, really strict laws banning money from politics. Um, those laws were written by us. <laughs> all the, all the. Um, you know, the New Deal things that we couldn't preserve here were preserved in Japan because we wrote them into Japanese law and they kept them. And so Japan's this weird time capsule where you could see what a Rooseveltian society would look like today. But anyway, in some ways. But um, but in Japan, you have very little uh, money in politics, actually. Like most forms of campaign advertising are just illegal. Um, most forms of lobbying are just illegal. You have, when you have very tiny amounts of corruption, you, you have corruption there. You have bureaucrats getting paid very small amounts and there's huge outcries and these people resign and, you know, they're disgraced forever over these tiny amounts of money that they, that they took for some unimportant thing, much less money in politics than America. And yet I, I think Japanese people, now, Japanese people do have a little bit higher electoral turnout than we do, but um, but people feel like they don't really have a voice. And, you know, there, there's been one party there that's ruled almost every year since, since 1955. And um, I'm not sure that just getting money out of politics is sufficient. Maybe it's necessary. But I'm not sure it's sufficient to give people this feeling of inclusion and this feeling of voice. Right. So, um... 
I suppose I will say I'm, I'm, I, I, I want people to feel that they have a voice, but more importantly than that, I want people to actually have a voice. And the, the thing about capital, pol- money and politics is that I think like thinking about, you know, campaign finance is a somewhat wonky and narrow view of money in politics. I think it's important. Mm-hmm. Um, but the most important thing is that when you have private firms with bosses at the top who own the firm and they reap the profits, those and those and that's how your economy is structured. They have they can always threaten capital strikes. So money and politics it, do, it doesn't have to do have, doesn't have to have anything to do with campaign donations. It's very essentially like you know let's talk about what happened in Seattle. Seattle tried to pass via their city council a minor tax on Amazon. Amazon threatened to simply up and move their had new headquarters that they were building or some sort of outpost of their headquarters and therefore, you know, do damage to Seattle's economy. And this was a, a unanimous decision to pass this, this levy, this new tax against Amazon. It was immediately reversed with all but either one or two votes in the city council because of the pressures the politicians are under to look after the economic security of the people that they represent. And they also know that if they don't do that, they won't get elected again. So, uh, therefore, capitalists don't have, they don't have to do anything with campaign donations. All they can do is threaten to up and leave. And in Japan, you know, I'm sure that the capitalists do the same thing. You have politicians that are catering to the capitalist class, you know, simply because they know that if they don't, they will experience, you know, outsourcing is a form of, like, long, slow capital strike. But there are also more dramatic forms of capital strikes that happen as a punishment for not looking after the interests of the narrow interests of the capitalist class instead of the broad interests of the working class majority. So when we talk about money in politics and the fact that it, you know, makes people not just not feel like they have a voice, but they just literally don't have a voice. The only answer really that I can see is to experiment with different kinds of firms that are publicly owned and see if that doesn't actually improve the voice that people actually have in their democracy. Because a state-owned firm is not going to up and leave because its purpose is not to maximize profit for the people who own it. Its purpose is to actually supply the things that people need in the society where it's rooted. Right. right. Now, um, two things about that. One thing is, you know, as I was mentioning before, we have a lot of our economy which actually already is public and provided by government. Roads, schools, you know, things like that. Um, those things can't threaten to up and move. Um, I wonder, yeah, I mean... Maybe it's just that in some other sectors, there still are some rich people, so that's the ones we focus on and see. And if there are any private sector remaining, there will be some rich people threatening to up and move about something. And so, therefore, in order to give people a feeling of of voice, a feeling that they control things, that we have to eliminate all private, the entire private sector and have fully centrally planned economies. Um, That seems like it could be a very steep bill for, for an emotional feeling of inclusion. Now, when we talk about people actually having a voice as opposed to just feeling it, I want to know, where do you think people actually have a voice in this world? Yeah. Where, Yeah, find me a place in the world where, according to your definition of what it means to actually, not just in your mind, have a voice in politics. Where is a place that people actually have a real voice? I'm not entirely sure what, what, what the question is angling toward. Um, you so said not, you want people to have an actual voice in politics, uh, yeah, yeah, not yeah. just a feeling. Yeah, I, want the work, I want the working, the majority of people who don't own massive productive assets to feel like their government exists, to, and not just to feel like it, but to know, because it's true, that their government exists right. to take care of them instead of to take care of capitalist interests, lest those capitalist interests up and leave. That's, that's what can, I mean. Can, do you know of such a place where that already exists in the world? I'm not entirely sure that I understand the question or where it's saying. I mean, I can answer. You said, I want, I want this thing. I said, do you know, uh, yeah. in America, Sorry. do you know a place where that exists already? So, so let me, let me be more specific. I'll answer the question. I'm just, I'm not sure. What's Megan, hold on, hold on. The question, I am a member, I'm a member of the Democratic Socialists of America. It's a membership um, driven organization. We have a democratic structure. We have elected representatives. We can recall them. We can um, have a le- democratic elections every year. And we um, have a full and complete oversight over the way that it's structured. And that's, you know, something that I participate on a, in, in on a regular basis. And I absolutely feel like I have a voice there. Despite the existence of all those rich people in America, capital strikes, Amazon, etc. Do you I feel, feel like, like you have a voice in America? In, in 
I'm completely confused. You asked me where I feel like I have a voice, and I told you an example. No, 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 no. So my question before was something different. Okay. I was going to I was going to say, can we find a country, maybe Cuba, oh. Bolivia, uh, Denmark, whatever, yeah. where 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 people currently do really, in your opinion, have a voice in their in their country? Oh, I believe that the countries that are closer on to socialism on the sort of like social democratic scale are places where people genuinely the, that the majority of people genuinely have a larger voice than in the United States. Now I understand your question better. Thank okay. You. Um, oh, sorry, yeah, I'm sorry for not asking that correctly. Um, so, so you, you say social? That, you mean like places like Denmark, France? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I don't feel that. I don't feel that in the. And you know, for for what it's worth, in case you're trying to sort of lump them all together, one of the reasons why I am a democratic socialist is that I vehemently oppose authoritarian forms of you know of, of socialism, and there are many of them that we can point to, and those are places where I feel like people genuinely don't have a voice. Right. So you think a person in, I don't know, pick a country, Denmark. Sure. Um, I just picked that because Bernie Sanders likes it. <laughs> but we could, we could pick another if you like, Norway, Sweden, France, whatever you like. Pick that country and could you show me concretely evidence that people there have more of a voice than people in America? The, yeah. the, not, not people. I don't mean people. I mean the average non-capital owning, let's say middle class or lower middle class working class, let's say person has more of a voice. Could we, could we show that they have more of a voice there than here? And how would we show that? Yeah. I mean, look, I'm not a wonk. I'm not, I don't, can't design an experiment for you on the spot in the course of this Skype call, but I'll tell you that, you know, in places where they have an entire year of parental leave and that's a right that the government protects, even though it hurts capitalist interests and profits and the bottom line, I'm pretty sure people feel like their government is looking out for their well-being in a way that people in the United States who have to literally go back to work after two weeks do not feel. And, right. it, and they feel this way, this way because it's true, right? It's so, so you're saying that the, the, the amount of voice can be seen from the results and the, mere, the fact that they have more pro-average person policies indicates that average people have more of a voice rather than just the patrician political class has decided to give people more things because of ethnic identification. What is at this ethnic identification thing? You're white, I'm white, I'll give you stuff because you're white. You think that the reason that social democracy exists is because of racism? That is a thing that many people claim. I don't, I am not taking position on that. That yeah. is a thing that, that people say, and I'm saying... You know that that's a that's a possibility that I entertain, um, but I I'm not sure if that's a long, a long, long, long history of socialists and radical unionists and social democrats and various people on the left of various stripes agitating for those sec- securing those gains over a long period. And I I know a little bit at least about the history of Sweden because I've read some pretty good articles about it, and this is pretty demonstrable. Um, I don't think it's it's just like per- perks by white people for white people. I think it's a long, long history of okay. militant trade unionism and socialist politics. Yeah. Right. The reason why they have those things. And, and right. Can't I guess, um, you know, from where I'm sitting, I, I've, I've uh, just looking at American politics my whole life, what I've seen is this consistent pattern where the Republicans have been able to um, have been able to block policies that help average people help poor people especially by saying essentially those poor people are black of course in reality a lot of them are white too but the republicans don't say that they paint it as if all the poor people are black and they say you're black the poor people are black do you want a black person taking your money they say to people who are actually on net government benefit recipients but don't realize it or don't want to admit it or whatever and those people will then vote Republican because they're like, I don't want my money going to a black person, blah, blah, blah. And I've seen this pattern happen again and again and again. And the claim that people make about places like Sweden and Denmark is that wasn't that that process wasn't able to happen. Right. OK, so at the ver- so then that makes a little bit more sense. And I think that I can talk about this in a way that, that makes sense to me as well. I mean, certainly if you can if, when you explain it like that, it makes it a little easier to it sounded like you were saying the reason that they exist at all, that we had to have social democratic policies in these places is because white people like to look out for white people, which I think is patently false and ignores the history of the sort of militant agitation. But at the same time, you, you make you make a point that I've certainly heard before. 
And I would say that there are certain iterations of it that I agree with and iterations that I don't. What I will say that I agree with is that racism in the United States is an extremely effective political tool that the capitalist class uses to divide working people and get them to not join together in working class solidarity to oppose capitalist class rule. That yes. is genuinely what I believe. Now, does that mean that it's a foregone conclusion that we can never have socialism in the United States because of racism? Absolutely not. But it means we have specific right. hurdles, and it means that our so our socialist advocacy needs to be explicitly anti-racist, and we need to present working working class, multiracial, and cross racial solidarity as a an alternative to racial animosity, to xenophobia, and various other like ethnic and cultural hostilities that exist in our culture. Yeah, but it's right. not it's not a fatal blow it's just the cards were dealt and frankly as a person who cares deeply about social oppression i think that social oppressions are so useful for the capitalist class in precisely that way that we might be able to say that capitalism needs them it doesn't need specific forms of them it can sort of cycle through forms of social oppression but it needs some sort of division within the working class to you know distract people to keep people at odds with one another so that they won't you know unite essentially and end the reign of ceos who make billions of dollars off of their labor um and since i care about social oppression i want to see the end of that hostility i think that capitalism perpetuates that hostility and 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 uh it's one more reason that i have to say that so Socialism seems like a better alternative than capitalism. Right. So what, anyway, but what I was what I was saying is, um, you, when I, I said, where do people really have more of a voice? Mm. And you said, okay, Sweden. And how do we know they have more of a voice? Because they get government policies that benefit average people more. And that, and I, that to the detriment of capitalist firms, for what it's right. worth. Right. So, so my... And my, my sort of retort was, okay, so what if American voters actually have just as much voice as Swedish voters, but they're using that voice to say, we don't like black people, or the Republican voters are using that to say, we don't like black people. And they're using that voice for some crap, racist crap, instead of give us more health care, give us more child care, give us more paid leave, all those things. Instead of, so in other words, what if Americans actually do have a voice? And it's just because of racism, they're using that voice for the wrong things. On the contrary, I think that Americans have less of a voice. And because Americans feel less empowered, they tend to turn toward places where they feel like they can exert control. Nobody in the United States really, honestly, frankly, before Bernie Sanders, who actually shattered the consensus a little bit, thought that it was possible to challenge the basic status quo, where rich people just get to get richer, and then nobody says anything about it. You have Democrats protecting corporate interests, you have Republicans protecting corporate interests, everybody just figured that was how it was. You can imagine that in that vacuum of disempowerment, people turn towards, because people's lives are somewhat difficult, they turn towards things where they feel like they can exert control, or things where they feel like they can sort of um, mm -hmm. Identify an enemy that they feel like they're, you know, matched to to defeat or whatever. Like and at least we can at least we can punch down on black people. Yeah, basically, yeah, and and so in some ways, I think that it's very important to build an alternative policy politics where we say no like you know the multiracial working class needs to unite together against the capitalist class that is doing things like denying us universal health care privatizing our schools uh polluting our environment um denying us you know paid parental leave which they have in other places and it works just fine because they don't care if we spend time with our newborn babies because that cuts into their profits and they have more of a voice than we do right right um yeah Um, so I, anyway, I, that yeah, I, I mean, yeah. if we're if we're hitting a lull, I'd like to. I, I hope I, I hope that that works. So I I just want to say like, you know, I hope that works. Mm -hmm. If you can figure out how to build a multiracial coalition for um, a lot of these changes that you're talking about, mm -hmm. I really really hope that that works. It's an, it's an uphill battle because the United States is a deeply disturbed culture in a lot of ways. Um, but I think yeah. it's the only way. Um, it's the only, it's the only way. Um, I, I wanted to return to, you know, 
like I said at the very beginning, you know, the, cook, the Marx quote about cookshops for the kitchens of the future and how they ought to be avoided. At some point, you, you said that Marx had detailed plans for communism. That's actually not, not true from what I understand from Marx. He was more talking, he was more focused on understanding how capitalism works and also to some extent detailing what a political response to capitalism from a socialist perspective would be. But he never really laid out plans for how a socialist society would work. Um, and for the economics of it. Hmm? That's right. That's right. For the economics, he, he uh, went yeah. in more, much more about the politics. Right, and so that's and so that's something that's up to up to us. And um, for one thing, you know, I think that when we talk about goods under capitalism, they're so they're not supply and demand are actually important concepts. I, I believe that they are. Like there, are, you know, there are, there's there's a demand, and we ought to be able to, you know, receive impulses from that demand and be able to like generate a supply that meets that demand. Un unfortunately, under capitalism, we see constant improper uh, valuation of commodities. So, like for example, oil. You burn it. It, it um, you burn it up. It pollutes the environment, and it's gone forever. It ought to be relatively expensive, but actually it's relatively cheap. Um, housing, you need it. You gotta live in it or else you're gonna die on the street. Ought to be relatively cheap or affordable. Instead, it's really, really expensive. So in some ways, I think it's important to note that at least for some socialists, myself included, socialism, building different types of firms that don't have profit as their primary motive is actually about getting closer to the heart of supply and demand. Um, for example, I, was, I wrote a book before I was full-blown socialists where I interviewed a lot of working class white people in rural America and this was before the election and I think I just had some some questions that actually became much more pressing as time went on about um, about the state of some, some people's lives and I was talking to people and more than one person in this tiny tiny isolated town in Nevada told me that Amazon had revolutionized their lives and made their lives significantly better because they didn't have to drive to Las Vegas, uh, you know, three hours each way on, you know, various a couple, a couple times every couple months um, to get the supplies that they need, which is time. They didn't have gas money. They didn't have, you know, this is amazing, right? The problem is that's completely incidental. Amazon didn't actually set out to do that. It was totally an accident. What Amazon set out to do was make massive profits for Jeff Bezos and the shareholders, and it was a total accident. What if we had firms that were designed to do that on purpose? Wouldn't we see any more innovation that would meet people's demand with supply if we could just calibrate it and eliminate this sort of like profit distraction almost? Sometimes we, it's like we're aiming for profit and sometimes we'll hit some targets of of, you know, of demand, in, but sometimes we won't, often we won't. Um, well, the, the people who defend free markets will say, if you aim for it, you're not going to get it. The only way you're going to get it is to have businesses try to make profits. If you, if you have businesses actually try to meet needs, they won't know what the needs really are. They'll get people telling you, you know, in other words, uh, there was this famous quote where if, um, I, I don't remember, I'm going to misquote this and people are going to laugh at me. Um, Henry Ford said, if I'd have asked my customers what they, you know, what they needed, they would have said a faster horse. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, um, and there's this idea that uh, only by having these entrepreneurs experiment with stuff with the motive of profit can they hit on stuff that, that people actually want, that people didn't even realize that they wanted, instead of going and taking a survey, what do you want? But see, that's actually the, the awesome part of markets, which like, you know, some socialists will tell you markets garbage, get them out of here. I'm not one of those. I think that markets mm -hmm. are interesting and they have a lot of information for us and, they, and we have to, you know, have some way to gauge what people actually want without asking them directly for the reason that you just mentioned but it's welcome not, to the neoliberals no no no. but it, no but here's the thing. It's, it is literally not it is absolutely not clear to me that the profit motive is necessary so if you had firms that had no boss and no shareholders that were autonomous that were competing to produce consumer goods with money that they had licensed from the state that was set up for that purpose and then they were competing with each other to like you know like you know produce the good that people would like the most, you would still have, you would still be able to receive market signals about what people wanted. The problem, I mean, there are... Why would they compete? 
they we could we could set them in competition with each other. This oh. is not possible. How do we tell them go compete? I, I mean, mean, what if they don't? Then, Why then would I, they do that? Well, they, they, because if, if they don't, then they are told that they are no longer viable, and then they get. How do we know that they're competing now? Like, no. how do you you look at them and they saying, "Oh, we're we're doing a good job." They submit their reports. They said. We did this and this and this, but how do you know they're really they're really trying? Like, what if what if they just suck and they're not really trying? Look, there's going to be some ways in which it's not going to be perfect, but right now the capitalist system is such that people are scrambling for profit and they make a lot of garbage that ruins our planet that nobody wants in their pursuit of profit, and that's just an equally big liability, if not an even bigger one. Actually, I mean. And let me be honest. I think that's a way bigger liability. So look, there's going to be some problems when we try to figure this out. But it's like it's not clear to me that, that means that we shouldn't have socialism instead of capitalism, right? Right. Can I, all right. I think it's about time for us to wrap up. I think so. Um, my rabbit wants her her food. Okay. And uh, I must respond to market signals. <laughs> and, um, so, right. but let me let me make a, a concluding statement, and then you and then you make a concluding statement. And my concluding statement is is this, which is. Um, there's a lot that's wrong with our current system and it needs to be fixed. Uh, I think that everybody who's reasonable and not just sort of motivated, not just sort of corrupt on some level, everyone who's reasonable knows that there are big problems in our society that need to be fixed. Um, there is a fear that during the, during the famous South sea bubble in England, um, there was a company that advertised its shares on the you know one of the first stock markets that said an undertaking of of great profit but no one to know what it is an undertaking of great advantage and some people just threw their money at this company that said our our plan is too secret to tell you what it is but you know it's going to make a lot of money of course they just took the money and ran and there is a reasonable rational fear that turning money over to people who don't, or turning political power over to a movement and to people who don't really know what their economic system is going to look like will result in a disaster that is worse than the current disaster, as has in fact happened in cases where people have tried big overhauls. And the fear, the status quo bias motivated by fear of ripping up the current system and handing it to the kind of people who like to design new systems from scratch is rational. And the people who have that are reasonable to have that fear. And that I think that where socialists need to work on is making it more concrete, not just saying we'll rip it up and we'll come up with something better. Let's save that for later. There needs to be more of a concrete plan and on healthcare. There already is a concrete plan we know what that will look like, but on a lot of other things, um, including getting money out of politics, eliminating profit, blah, 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 having a competing government-owned companies and blah, all this stuff, I'm not saying this sucks, we should never do it, we should use, this is a disqualifying question. Mm -hmm. I'm saying this is a question that needs to be answered before reasonable people will trust ripping up our current system and going with something very new. I think that's uh, totally fair, and I completely uh, agree with it, actually. I will say that right now, socialists are such a small minority, a growing, growing minority, but such a small minority that's drawing from a layer of passionate ideologues and not a layer of wonks. So right now, we have a dearth of, you know, people who love to sit down and fiddle with this stuff. I know a few people who are really good at it. As you've, you know, I, I'm, I'm no wonk myself. I'm one of the more like passionate ideologues drawn to this by my like sheer revulsion at the horrors of capitalism. But I um, think that, you know, a lot of people who watch blogging heads are these kinds of people, right? And if you're interested in like participating in this project where we figure out what, how cool it would be to build firms that try to like directly meet, um, you know, demand with supply instead of, you know, hitting it accidentally on your way to profit, maybe maybe we could use some, and we could certainly use some more of these people. Um, and, uh, you know, the doors are open for wonks, so we can figure it out. <laughs> All right, well, cool. thanks. We should go. Get it's off. been great. Yeah, it's been awesome.